Anna Seewald, and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about personal development in the context of parenting, where I explore how you can find more calm, connection, and joy in parenting through the process of self-discovery and inner growth with a trauma-informed lens. I'm a parent educator, and my mission is to help children by helping parents. The motto of this podcast is Raising Our Children, Growing Ourselves. Today, the long-term impact of parental mental health on children. A really fascinating, thought-provoking, and eye-opening conversation with Danielle Rubinov, a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. In this episode, we discuss how experiences of stress and trauma early in life shape trajectories of physical and mental health in children. Not all children who experience trauma and adversity early in life go on to develop physical and mental health problems. What are the risk and protective factors? My guest says that most of the research tends to focus on minimizing risk factors. However, by learning about the protective factors, we can promote resilience. In October 2022, Danielle will join the Department of Psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to direct the Child and Adolescent Mood and Anxiety Disorders Program. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of California, Los Angeles, and her doctorate in psychology from Arizona State University. After a two-year fellowship in developmental psychology, Danielle joined the faculty at UCSF, where she serves as the director of the Childhood Adversity and Resilience Lab. In her program of research, she leads basic and translational studies to understand the processes through which early adversity affects children's mental health and develop interventions that help at-risk children and families develop resilience. Daniel's work is funded by federal, state, and private foundation grants, including the National Institute of Mental Health, California Governor's Office, and Brain and Behavior Foundation. She's been recognized with Early Career Research Awards by the Association for Psychological Science and American Psychosomatic Society. I truly enjoyed speaking with Danielle, and this is a super packed episode. Here are some of the things we covered. What is the most single important protective factor for resilience? The importance of predictability in children's lives, the parental emotional regulation and its impact on children's well-being, how mental health and physical health are not separate and how they affect one another, how we need to destigmatize mental health and normalize seeking mental health help for parents, how to know that you're struggling, what signs to look for, what are some health consequences across the lifespan because of the early adversities we have experienced and the long-term impact of the pandemic. I told you this is an amazing episode, really jam-packed with great information and practical tips. Before we get to this conversation, I would like to suggest a few past episodes from our library that are relevant to today's topic. Episode 247, a solo episode titled The Three R's of Pandemic Parenting. Episode 281, The Power of Self-Regulation with Sarah McLaughlin. Episode 315, How to Help Kids with Emotional Self-Regulation with Mona De La Hook. Episode 325, Parental Burnout, Causes, Signs, and How to Cope with It with Kate Golick. And the last one is one of the recent episodes, Why Early Years Matter with Dana Saskind. I hope you'll find value in today's conversation. Please enjoy. 
Well, Danielle, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me here today. I am very interested in your research. Unfortunately, I haven't read any of the articles because it's not available for the general public, but I'm interested in the subject matter. So what I would love to begin with is, can you tell us what are your research interests currently? Absolutely. So really broadly, I'm interested in children that have experiences of stress or or trauma early in life and the ways that that shapes their trajectories of physical and mental health. And, you know, even more specific than that, really interested in the risk and protective factors. So we certainly know that not all children who experience trauma and adversity early in life go on to develop physical or mental health problems. There are factors that increase the risk that those things occur. And then there are other buffering or protective factors. So I'm really interested in understanding those, those specifically the protective factors that kind of can help promote resilience and and help uh, uh, children have positive physical and mental health, even if they've experienced trauma early in life. And once we know what those protective or buffering factors are, those are the factors that we can begin to develop prevention and intervention programs around to to really target those children who have been exposed to stress and adversity early in life. Mm, As opposed to focusing on minimizing the risk factors or where we're we're dealing with both, we're minimizing the risk factors and increasing the protective factors. That's a, that's a really great question. I think it is both. I will We'll share that I, I, I think the majority of research tends to focus on the risk factors, tends to focus on minimizing risk. And it's understandable because experiences of stress and adversity are, are really, they, they induce a lot of negative outcomes. And so the research, I think, tends to focus on risk factors. What I'm trying to build in my program of research is better assessment of those protective factors to measure positive adjustment and positive outcomes so that we can do both at the same time so that we can both minimize risk and promote um, protective factors. Yeah, I I, I love your focus, definitely. So how come you're interested in, in this? Where does your research interest come from? I'm I'm curious the origin story, or did you just stumble upon or haphazardly ended up here, or maybe it's more personal, perhaps? It's, I I, I think, a little bit of both. After I uh, got my bachelor's, um, I I knew that I was interested in research, but wasn't specifically, wasn't necessarily set on a, a particular program of research. And I had the good fortune of developing or, or working in a, in a research lab that was um, uh, doing research on, on children with very serious pain conditions and life-limiting illnesses. And I think it was through those experiences that I started to develop a lot of interest in just looking at these very formative early years of life. We know in particular, you know, those first five, six years of of early development have the power to to shape trajectories of of health across the lifespan. And I think I was was just incredibly intrigued by how powerful those early life experiences were. I think that's where where my my interest really started. I think on a personal note, um, I have a mom who was a, a high school counselor. And I think I was raised in an environment where we talked a lot about emotions and addressed emotions really um, in in a very direct way. And that I I think um, being raised in that sort of an environment where there was a lot of talk and and acknowledgement of mental health um, might have influenced my trajectory. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk about the the critical first few years which is very startling when you acquaint yourself with the research on resilience. I read once that the first year is very critical, especially the first year in terms of resilience. If you experience adversity or maltreatment in the first year, it doesn't go right from the beginning. 
and then later in life, your life is amazing, right? There is no traumas or anything. You're still, it's, it's still not good because the first year, the head start wasn't good as opposed to someone who had a very nurturing and good first year. And then they experience adversities. They do much better in terms of resiliency. So I don't know whose research that was, but it stuck with me because I was always curious in this subject myself, someone who experienced trauma at an early age. I saw around me, some people thrive, some people barely survive, some people die, couldn't get by. And I always was like, wow, what's, what's going on? How come uh, the children in my classroom for we all experienced the earthquake right it was on a massive scale so it was this experiment for me to see how adults cope with it and each adult coped differently they were thrivers and they were non-thrivers and children it was the same thing and i was always curious like what's obviously now i know a lot more as, as a grown up and but this has been a personal interest. You know, what makes people resilient? What are those protective factors? How come I didn't kill myself when I was in ninth grade and my, my neighbor did, right? We had similar experiences. So I am very curious personally to talk to you about this and hopefully provide some valuable information to the listener. I'm hoping that there are things we can do as protective measures as individuals? Yeah, there absolutely are. One of the things that the research tells us is that having at least one safe, loving, secure, nurturing relationship with a caregiving figure is one of the single most protective, resilience promoting factors in a child's life. And that does not necessarily need to be a biological parent. Oftentimes the adversity that children can experience might be in relation to the care that they're receiving from a, a parent. Sadly, in cases of abuse or ne neglect or maltreatment, um, there are certainly children who experience parental loss. And over the course of the, the pandemic, that is one you know, early adverse experience that it has, has certainly increased. There are so many children that have lost primary caregivers. For those children, one of the single most protective factors is a, a nurturing relationship with another caregiving figure. And some of my work has shown that, um, you know, for example, a warm, supportive relationship between a, a, a teacher and a child can protect against the effects of a more negative conflictual family environment. And so, you know, even just thinking that just one really special, caring, loving adult can be that protective factor for children who experience early adversity. What are some other protective factors? Mm. Um, in general, I think another factor that we, we know to really help children who have experienced early adversity is predictability in their routine, having, knowing what to, to expect, having house routines in their household, whatever that might be, predictability and control, knowing what to anticipate. Um, so again, I, I reference the pandemic again, only because it's, you know, one of the, the stressors that has been most salient to children's lives over the past couple of years. And one of the things that we've recommended to families and caregivers is in this time that is so unpredictable and disruptive, what are routines that you might be able to have in, in place um, that, that help support children, family dinners, um, a schedule, um, game nights, movie nights, uh, again, building in predictability in this time that feels so, so incredibly unpredictable. We also certainly think about, you know, particular types of parenting or, or child rearing that we know to be really beneficial for children. So, you know, that includes high levels of sensitivity and, and nurturance between parents and children. I think these are things that certainly we, we logically know, but we might really underestimate the power of these things. So interacting with ways in, in children, with children that are, that are very, very responsive with really young children, that can be incredibly simple. I 
work quite a bit with interventions that um, support caregivers of infants and toddlers. And when we think about responsive parenting in those contexts, that's just the, the easy back and forth that parents and, and children can have. A child is playing with a ball and throws a parent a ball. Oh, you threw me the ball. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I have this, but I'm going to throw it back to you. It doesn't necessarily need to be really complicated. We can think about these simple everyday parenting type behaviors that are, that are incredibly powerful to support um, uh, children who are going through uh, adverse experiences. Yeah, that, that's really remarkable how something small like that can impact and impact a child. What could you say about the consistency in how the parent reacts to the child, the parental emotional regulation, the consistency in there. This is something I talk about a lot and teach. Is there research around this? Because you can have predictable routines, right? Consistent dinners and bedtimes and things of this nature. Sometimes it's easy to establish those. What I find is hard is when the caregiver has a hard time being consistent with their anger, with their frustration. They either withdraw in some situations or they lash out. They, their emotional outbursts or the way they respond are very drastically different from the day before, very inconsistent. What can you tell about that or is there research around this? Absolutely. That's such a great question. I think we often underestimate the power of an adult or a caregiver's own regulation of their own emotions as a foundational skill that helps them appropriately respond to children. And, and I think when we take a step back, it's easy to, to consider how hard would it be to help calm a child down if you yourself are are really reactive if you are very stressed but oftentimes when we are trying to support young children there's a, a kind of a lack of attention to helping the caregivers develop their own emotion regulation skills that's really the first step you know just to to kind of bring it back to a, a, a an example that we've all heard before when you are on an airplane every single time you've probably heard this before we've all heard this before if you are are traveling with a young child you you put your own oxygen mask on before you help your child and uh, again we, we've heard it throughout our our lives but it's a really powerful kind of image or example to think about in this own situation where in order to support children who are struggling with socio-emotional or behavioral issues as a, as a caregiver, you really have to focus on your own emotion regulation first um, to really be able to respond in a way that helps a child calm down or develop emotion regulation skills. Yeah, because we know stress is contagious, right? Parental stress or stress otherwise, emotions are contagious. And one of the risk factors you talk about is parental mental health, right? So if that's not there, of course, it's going to affect children. If a parent is always stressed out, how is it affecting the kid? If the parent is always anxious or depressed, not present, how is it going to impact the kid? It is, I think, so imperative. It begins with us. I think the, the building those skills in us as parents is so foundational. The rest will come into play. It, it will happen. You know, you can't play ball with your kid if you're not regulated, if you're too stressed out, or if you're dealing with something. It, it just will not happen. Your child will sense a distress in you, right? That's absolutely right. One of the risk factors that I focus quite a bit of research on is exposure to parental depression. So, for example, we know that children who are exposed to parental depression early in life are up to six times more likely to develop a mood or anxiety disorder themselves. And that occurs through a variety of, of different pathways. Of course, it's, it's really complex, but I think there are two main pathways 
through which that occurs. So when a parent is, is um, struggling with depression, one pathway is through parenting. It is so hard to be the parent that you want to be when you are struggling with your own feelings of depression. It, it really, depression gets in the way. It is such a barrier, I think, for a lot of parents being the kind of parent that they want to be. And oftentimes depression really can affect those interactions between parents and children, but it's not just parenting. I think there's a component and, and you sort of referenced this Children pick up on the behaviors, the facial expressions, the verbalizations, uh, the mannerisms when, when parents are struggling with depression. So there's kind of a modeling that's also happening as well. So it's not enough to simply support parents in their parenting, certainly we should do that as well, but we need to support parents in their own mental health outside of parenting if we really want to disrupt that transmission of depression from a parent to a child. And of course, we know we oftentimes talk about that association between that, that transmission of depression as thinking that it operates just from parents to children, but we we know that's not true. That association is actually bi-directional. So children, parents are affecting children, but children are affecting parents too. It's not just one way. So we, we really need to be thinking about the support at the level of the family, not just parents or just children. I love that. I love that so much. It is bi-directional. And I, I read another piece of research, I'm, you know, writing my own book. So this is of all of interest to me that children of depressed mothers act out more. So they, they show acting out behaviors. I interviewed someone recently about parental burnout uh, during the pandemic from Ohio State University. They did a study back in 2021 in February, March, February, like the beginning of the pandemic was over, but there were residual, you know, factors like burnout in parents and parents are still struggling. Like we're not over our stress or burnout, right? According to their report, two thirds of working parents experienced some level of burnout. And of course it had impact on children, right? If a parent is burnt out, they're not going to ace their parenting game, right? It's, it's just going to affect them. And, you know, increased alcohol use in the parent, lashing out, yelling, using physical forms of punishments and harm towards their children, not only criticism and all of that increased because the parents simply was in burnout and they couldn't parent. I think the first thing would be to destigmatize if a mom is depressed or if a mom has anxiety, has mental health issues. I think that's the first step so that the parent will not feel bad and seek help, right? That you're not a bad parent. You're just struggling with this. And of course, you're not going to be a hundred percent there for your kids. And there's no shame in that. I think a lot of people suffer in silence because of that. A lot of moms, especially who are depressed, right? They're not going to seek help on their own. And it's just this vicious cycle that they get stuck in. What could you say about that um, in terms of getting help for them? And, or if someone is listening, that's the type of parent, you know, they, they resonate with this. Yeah, that's, that's such an excellent point. I, I think concerns around stigma and worries that come up um, if, if a parent were to disclose some sort of um, struggle in, in worrying that people would feel that they are unfit to parent can really keep people from seeking the help that they need. And you're absolutely right with, I think, just normalizing and, and validating the struggle that all parents are going through right now. I am sadly not surprised by the, the statistic that you shared, because I think those rates of, of parental burnout are 
are incredibly high right now. We have similar statistics about uh, parental anxiety and depression when we compare rates of parental anxiety and depression during the pandemic compared to pre-pandemic levels. The research is suggesting that they are two to three times higher during the pandemic compared to the pre-pandemic level. So I want to start first by by really validating and, and normalizing that experience. And, and I, I would hope that parents hear that you're really not alone in those struggles. You are not the one, only one going through this. I think a a second piece to think about is, you know, for so long, we really tended to dichotomize physical health as if it were separate from mental health. And so in that way, people might have no concerns about going to the doctor to treat a a sore throat or a a sprained ankle, or they have a fever or a cough. There's no, not necessarily any stigma around that, but yet we think about mental health as being so different. And so we wouldn't seek care for, for mental health. And what I would really love to see, and I think a lot of people are working on this, is really to try to erase that dichotomy they're not separate. Physical health affects mental health. Mental health affects physical health. So why not approach care in the same way? If you are struggling with anxiety or depression, if we if we would treat that as we treat physical health conditions, there would be no concern around seeking that care. And obviously that's not going to occur overnight, but moving towards that idea that physical and mental health are not so separate and the same care that you deserve for your physical health, you deserve for your mental health. And I think, you know, on that note, where I'm kind of going with a lot of my work is um, that caregivers, and I think moms in particular, will seek out care for their children's anxiety, depression, behavioral concerns, but they won't necessarily seek care for themselves. And so one thing I think we as a mental health community can do is really, again, begin to incorporate parents more in prevention and treatment programs for for children, because that might be a way to reach more parents if they're coming in seeking care for their child. Could there be a program that also incorporates care for parental mental health in the context of supporting children as a way to, to reach both caregivers and children if caregivers otherwise wouldn't seek care for themselves? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with that. And I totally support that, right? If a parent comes and, and say, because a parent is going to see the problems in the kid, whether it's acting out, ADHD type of symptoms or anything like that through children's behavior, you're going to see that something is going on in my child. So you seek help, you call a therapist or you come to see you know, a parenting professional. And, and then I, I always ask them what's going on with them, what's happening, what changes. And they're always surprised to parents that, Uh, no, 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 Anna, you don't get it. Like my child is doing X, exhibiting this kinds of behavior. I need help with that. But it begins with you. It all roads lead to you, right? It's like bi-directional. Yes, we can help your kid, but we also want to help the parent. I think it's such important message. And, And there is no shame in this, right? If your child is behaving in a certain way that is out of character or exhibiting some symptoms. I think when you seek help for your kid, maybe seek help for yourself too. If there is nothing else going on for you, at least you can get support in dealing what your child is going through. So it's beneficial uh, all the way around. I think it's, it is beneficial. Even if there's not necessarily some underlying mental health condition in the caregiver, having a child that's struggling is inherently stressful. And I think supporting caregivers can increase the effectiveness of our treatment programs from, for children, because you know, oftentimes these treatment programs, we're only seeing children for an hour, one day out of the week, the rest of their time, they're in their family environment or their school environment. And so supporting the people around the child's 
is a means to really continue to promote whatever practices and um, you know new behaviors the child is developing in the context of the treatment program. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, I know someone who has a child with autism, a teenager now, this boy is very aggressive and, and the father is, I feel so bad for the father. And I'm always asking, like, do, he's my neighbor. Do you seek help for yourself? Like you're doing everything for your kid, but the kid beats the father, scratches the father, gets very physical, right? Just living day in and day out with that, it, it's incredibly stressful and taxing. And parents do need support. P- p- parents who have children with special needs or neurodiverse. And I think we can't emphasize that that support for parents, it doesn't have to be like, you don't need to have a mental health diagnosis to get support. If you're struggling, if you're going through a lot, and if you resent your kids, that's okay too. So I think finding support for yourself is, is important in, 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 like you said, one of the protective factors in, you know, when it comes to adversity or trauma is having a nurturing, supportive person. It doesn't change throughout our life, right? We always need that loving, supportive other who can be a source of support for us and resiliency. Even if we're adults, we can't do it all alone. I think that mentality has to banish from our culture, that ragged individualism, especially in the United States, you know? And if you're not doing it alone and you're not acing it, then there's something wrong with you. No, you're not meant to do this alone, period. Right, right. right. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think to your point, there is also this sense of uh, unless I am really struggling, just in extreme distress, I, I shouldn't seek support. But oftentimes our ability to intervene and protect or reduce symptoms, it is so much easier to do that before problems have reached an absolutely unbearable level. But I think related to stigma, there is this idea that I have to wait until I absolutely can't stand it one second longer before I'm deserving of of help or support. And in actuality, that's very much not true. And, and the, the course to feeling better is oftentimes much smoother if we intervene when we first start to see some issues, if we intervene a little bit earlier, much, much easier um, to help support an individual than waiting until until it's too late. Yeah. The, the, there is a saying, they say, until the knife hits the bone, or I'm, I think it's in my culture. I'm trying to translate. Yeah. If you wait until it's too late, it's like, wow, now we have to do so much more work and, and, you know, but if it's, yeah, I think it's so important. Thank you for that point. How about health consequences throughout the lifespan of children who grow up in an environment when a caregiver, a parental figure has mental health issues? You, you mentioned already that they may develop if, you know, depressed or anxious moms, the kids can have um, depression or anxiety. Um, how about other health uh, issues, physical health, particularly throughout, the, because I was interested in this, in this question for myself, right? Uh, how my whole early childhood experiences, uh, am I going to develop some kind of illnesses or health issues or whatever health issue I develop? I'm like, is this related to that? So I would love to explore this with you a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great question. I think the over the past few decades, we know more and more about the, the consequences of adverse experiences before the, the age of 18 on health across the lifespan into middle adulthood, late adulthood, well into to later life. The, the research started out very interesting, seminal studies conducted in the 80s where they would ask individuals to in, indicate which of these about 10 adverse experiences did you develop before the age of 18 and then look at a variety of of physical health conditions across the lifespan, really spanning a variety of different categories. So diabetes, 
cardiovascular disease, cancer, early signs of aging, the higher levels of injury exposure. And what we see is on average, these experiences, these early adverse experiences tend to increase risk for all of those physical health conditions across the lifespan. I think it's important to emphasize, though, that it's not a one-to-one correlation. Um, I worry sometimes when we talk about this that people might get the sense that these experiences undoubtedly determine the the course of their physical health across the lifespan. And and I want to share, just as as we were talking about earlier, that um, it's not that, that deterministic. It's certainly not the case that if you've experienced any one of these types of early adverse experiences, you will, you know, absolutely develop heart disease or cancer, or diabetes, or other types of chronic illnesses. It certainly can raise the risk, particularly in the presence of other risk factors. But we know that there's so much variability, just as you were talking about between you and your classmates, that it's not the case that that everyone will, will go on to develop the physical health conditions um, because of early stress exposures. Yeah, but I'm glad there is talk about this, right? Because if if, if a child is exposed to, and, and the adverse childhood experiences, the list of 10 questions, I think is very limited. I think they need to increase that. And during the pandemic, I recorded an episode. I can't remember which one, but I'll put it in the show notes for the listener to reference that. I think it's called the three R's of pandemic parenting. I titled it and it was a solo episode. And of course, in the pandemic, I was thinking bad thoughts, negative stuff a lot. And I said in one of the episodes that the pandemic is going to be an ace, an adverse childhood experience for some people. So I would love to hear your thoughts. I know a lot of families thrived. We created the routines and the schedules and the predictabilities. We ate together. We walked together. We did all of those. And um, some of us came out less scarred than others. But of course, there are people who who suffered immensely. And are is there research around this? Number one, I want to know. Number two, could this be considered as an adverse childhood experience for this generation? Great question. Um, yes, to, to your first question, um, I've heard other people kind of describe the, the variability of pandemic experiences as saying something like, you know, we may have all experienced the, the same storm, but we weren't all in the same boat, meaning that people's resources and capacity and protection from the stressors and challenges of the pandemic um, were very much not equal. And I think when we think about the variability of experiences, there were many communities that ex- that disproportionately experienced challenges during the pandemic um, that were harder hit in terms of um, the, the financial impact of the pandemic, COVID-19 infections, school closures, all of those things, those tended to be um, uh, uh, racial and ethnic minority communities, lower income communities. They, they really experienced a, a, a disproportionate impact of the pandemic compared to others. And, and I think we see the consequences of that on physical and, and, and mental health conditions in those communities. And there is certainly research to support that, um, looking at rates of infection, physical and mental health conditions, we, we see disproportionate rates in, in, in these types of communities. How about the, for the kids, right? I mean, it's one thing, it's the parent, a grown-up person. How about the kids who are below the age of 18 in those, in those communities? What are the risks for those kids? Yeah, I think they have also experienced more pandemic challenges. So th- there is research to suggest the impact on school closures in terms of greater, more disruption in, in schools. So oftentimes schools in, in wealthier communities had more resources to be able to institute hygiene, ventilation practices, social distancing, all of those things that allowed children to return to school safely. Oftentimes 
in less resourced communities, they did not necessarily have the ability to do this. So lower income, often racially and ethnically diverse communities, children were out of school uh, without that routine, maybe uh, attempting to, to do virtual school, but the resources for doing virtual school are, are, are certainly not robust in a lot of these communities. So I think those children were very much harder hit by the pandemic and the disruptions to their their school um, and the effect that that will have on their educational attainment is, is much greater than than children who are in wealthier communities, oftentimes, um, you know, majority culture, white communities. Absolutely. Also, the, for the kids in in, 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 um, in that group, school was not only a source of education, information, stability, routine, a safe place to be. For some and for many, schools were a place where they can get their one and only meal per day. Because I lived in a community here in, in, in the United States for 15 years where that was the case for, for the school kids. And then if the school isn't there, you know, they're not, where are they getting their next meal? And of course, their parents were probably the frontline workers who were do doing jobs that they were exposed to the virus more than, than, than people who can work from their computer from home. They probably died more, got sick more in those communities, the stress of the parents, I, I mean, like I often think, wow, this this is like I talk to privileged people, let's say, quote unquote, who who thrived and baked all sorts of sourdough breads and did amazing art projects and things like that. But I want to talk about the people who really struggled, who didn't have food, who didn't have access to resources, to education, to computers, to Wi-Fi. They didn't feel safe in their own home, safe in the sense that there was domestic violence, rates were high. And we know that when the parent is burnt out, they're hitting their kids. And so that was high. And, and, and so there's so much invisible stuff that I hope it will be talked about and researched and this population would will get help maybe in 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 the future or now this was like an alarm we saw what's happening but I don't see it covered a lot unfortunately not on social media of course they're not going to be in social media saying you know we struggled right they are like the disadvantaged people they're always like in the background hidden somewhere invisible it's really sad, like you can have such drastic experiences within a community. Absolutely. Yes. And I, I will say, I think we, I, I'm part of a couple of different research teams that have these ongoing projects that attempted. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think we're seeing some research come out during the pandemic that has conducted single time point uh, surveys or questionnaires with caregivers, with families. And so we're getting this um, snapshot, a single point in time with estimates of um, mental health problems, other challenges. But I think what's incredibly important is the ability to, as you were saying, look at these families over time. And so I'm part of a couple of different research studies where we had existing families that were recruited into studies pre-pandemic, where we were collecting some of this data around um, parent mental health, child mental health, environmental conditions, families. And during the pandemic, as best we could, we continued to collect that data and we will continue to follow them over time. Because I think what we don't know enough of yet is the, the longer term impacts of the pandemic and how functioning pre-pandemic factors related to the, the family and the parent pre-pandemic may affect the long-term outcomes of these children and families during the pandemic. And so this research, I, I hope, will begin to ask and answer those questions where we can say, what were the factors occurring pre-pandemic that helped predict better or worse adjustment over the course of the pandemic? Mm, so this is an ongoing research? Yeah, I would be interested in, in finding out those results. Yeah, we have, to your point, 
we just begun to look at this data, but um, there's one study, multiple sites. We have families in San Francisco, um, in Memphis, Tennessee, in Seattle, and leave in Rochester. And we have some pre-pandemic data, but but also very interested to see the pattern of parents that were able to work from home, who had paid leave, who were supported in taking time off work if, that, that if they were sick. And certainly the, the preliminary data suggests very, very much what you were saying, where communities of color less likely to be able to work from home, um, less likely to have, have paid time off, less likely to be encouraged to take time off when they were sick. And of course, those sorts of parent or caregiver experiences will have downstream effects on children. And this is what we're starting to look at. Yeah. And that's why I was, you know, asking, I was thinking about this early on in the pandemic and people were, were saying, no, you are pathologizing. When I said, this is going to be an adverse childhood experience, it's going to be considered. People looked at me funny and they said that I'm catastrophizing and, and I came to doubt myself at some point and say, am I really, am I, you know, it seems like a lot of people came out of it in an okay way, scarred, but okay. Right. But that population who we don't see, I always wonder what are the long-term mental and physical health effects. And I think it is going to be like, like the adverse childhood experiences, especially on the younger kids. There, there were a lot of studies, uh, not a lot, a few that I came across that showed children who were born in the pandemic, right? They're already two years old or, or right before the pandemic who are toddlers now. Their speech, there's a lot of speech delays and developmental issues. My sister-in-law is a speech pathologist and the number of children who need that help uh, is incredibly high. You know, I talk to preschool teachers uh, and I train them and what we see is a lot of behavioral issues, social emotional lack skill set, like atrophied a lot of skills in children. So even if if you're not in that population, the low socioeconomic or minority groups, that there are a lot of ongoing issues, cognitive development, language development, delays and things of this nature, right? There are studies um, going on. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of one study. Um, I can certainly send it to you. I, I believe it was published in JAMA or JAMA Pediatrics, but they looked at women who had COVID-19 in pregnancy, and then they looked at various birth outcomes. One of the things, um, if I'm remembering correctly, and hopefully I am, that I think was really interesting about that study is they found that it was prenatal stress rather than, than simply the experience of having COVID-19 itself that was associated with certain adverse birth outcomes, but it was perceived stress a, a, among the pregnant individual that was related to outcomes. And I think that's important to note that, again, related to one's own experience of stress, you know, separate from the objective stressor that you're going through, but one's own experience experience of stress in a caregiver um, can, can affect um, the, the, the child. Um, and again, I think we're, we're just beginning to, to really understand the, the impact of, of parents' experiences of the, of the pandemic on, on children. Mm. Wow. It's just pretty remarkable, interesting, fascinating. What ideas or suggestions you may, you may share to lighten up the, this, this topic, to help the parents either to, I mean, we already mentioned certain things that, you know, destigmatize mental health, seek support, you don't wait till the, like, it's too late, things of this nature. I'm wondering if you could uh, part some wisdom or tips if, if you have any for the parents. Yeah, great question. Uh, Are you a parent yourself? So I'm, I'm not a parent myself, actually, <laughs> uh, but have certainly had a lot of experience working with parents um, and certainly deeply wanting, very deeply committed to, to helping to support them. And, you know, I think, I think it does go back to uh, several of the things that, that you mentioned in that the step one is really to prioritize yourself and, and, and your own mental health. 
And I think oftentimes there is this perception that it, it might need to be some grand gesture um, or, or grand behavior. Not always the case, particularly if we're thinking about intervening earlier, that might mean working with your support network to carve out 30 minutes a day where you can take a walk, do something for yourself, engage in some, some pleasant activities, something that's, that's stress reducing. It might necessarily not necessarily mean seeking formal therapy or medication. And I, I really want to expand our perspective to, to think about those things that intervening to support mental health can look like a lot of different things and might not necessarily mean engaging with a professional. Sometimes it does. And that's okay too, but there are certainly things that we might be able to build into our own routine to support that. And that does mean leaning on your support network to ask for help, which I think is really hard for a lot of people and a lot of caregivers. And so practicing that particular skill of, of asking for help in ways that supports your own mental health, I think is, is incredibly important. I think as a parent, there often is a lot of pressure on being the perfect parent, on having the best parenting, on, on never making a mistake, on always being there for your child in every way, always. And that, that's unrealistic. And so there's a, a phrase that I think is shared by a lot of people who support parents is that more often than not being a good enough parent is okay. And it's pretty good, actually. You're doing a good job. And so I'd like to introduce that idea to you, to, to all, all parents out there, that your idea of a good enough parent is probably good enough and, and not holding yourself to an unrealistic expectation of perfection as a parent all the time is really important. Serving perfect meals, perfect experiences, those sorts of things. Yeah. I think the important thing I want to highlight in, in what you're saying is it doesn't have to be a formal quote unquote diagnosis of anxiety, depression, or, uh, or any mental health issue for the parent to, to seek help. I think I can't emphasize that enough. And I want to ask you, how can a parent know that they're struggling uh, right? Because if you don't have a big diagnosis or big issues, we did the burnout episode and I got so much feedback from people saying, wow, thank you. I just realized that I am in burnout. That episode hit home for many people. It opened their eyes. I think talking about those subjects and, and uh, illuminating, raising the awareness, educating people, I think is key. And what I want to ask you is, what are some signs that someone is struggling in order to seek help, either formal help like therapy or, or, or just some other in their network, right? What could you say to that person? I mean, what to look for? Because if I'm not struggling very much and I'm, and this has been the way it is, like, you know, how am I going to get help? What's going to help me? So what's that line, right? There's the mental health diagnosis and this other population. Like I, I mentioned already one, when you resent your kids, when you don't want to be present, those kinds of things. Uh, are there any signs that you can mention? Absolutely. You know, I think this can appear in a few different ways. I think sometimes some of the most um, concrete signs are those physical or, or, or physiological sensations. We're oftentimes apt to notice those. So that might be, you know, disruptions or changes in your sleep, uh, you know, having a really hard time falling asleep, not sleeping enough, sleeping too much can be a really concrete sign. Changes in your appetite, either you know, not feeling hungry at all or feeling really hungry kind of general lethargy, having a hard time kind of getting going, um, feeling like you're, you're just kind of moving really slowly. Um, those sorts of physical signs, I think with um, anxiety, you know, feeling that it's a very, can be a very physical feeling, feeling tense all the time, feeling like your muscles are tense, you're holding a lot of tension. Again, those sorts of physical sensations can be signs. 
other than that, I, I also think of, about reflecting on ways that you might be feeling that are getting in the way of doing your daily activities, um, the things that you want to do. I think one of the biggest signs that we often look out for is, are you not doing the things um, that used to bring you pleasure? Are you not doing those things anymore? That's a pretty big sign that you might be really struggling. So hobbies, enjoyable activities, if you just don't feel like doing those things anymore can be a sign. Your um, kind of outlook on the future, if you're having a hard time finding sources of hope or optimism if your kind of outlook on the future is is pretty low again another another sign so those are the things i would say to kind of look out for excellent i love it thank you as as we approach the tail end of this conversation is there anything that i didn't ask that you would like to share before we say goodbye in terms of how parental stress uh, mental health affects children's mental health and physical health? I think the, the other point that I've been increasingly aware of and one that I've been talking about with my colleagues more and more is our need from a policy perspective, from a systemic perspective, to think about the ways that we support parents, caregivers, to be the kind of parent that they want to be. Again, a lot of our prevention and intervention programs focus on improving parenting. I study those types of programs. I believe in them passionately, and I think they are incredible. But I also think that we can't put all of the burden on parents if we're not supporting them at a systems level, at a policy level with things like paid family leave. And, and those sorts of policy things are, in my mind, an increasingly important part of the ways that we support caregivers in this country. And so that's something that's, you know, a, a direction I'm, I'm going with my, my research, but, but really thinking not only just family level parenting support, but, but more systems level policy perspectives that, um, that we really need to be thinking about to, to support caregivers in this country. A hundred percent agree with you. I just interviewed Dana Saskin, the author of Parent Nation, and that's all she talks about. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend she is proposing amazing ideas in that book and shares examples of programs in this country and in other countries, how they have achieved that, that it's not only solely an individual's responsibility, and this is a collective effort to raise and care for our children. And I, I can't recommend that book highly enough. I, I had a very lovely conversation with her. And I agree with you. Yeah, we can't do this alone. We need those policy changes. And one statistics she quoted was in the Netherlands, no, in, in, in Scandinavian countries, I think in Norway, per child, the country pays $29,000 per toddler per year. And in the United States, $500. In Germany, it's 18,000. In other European countries, it's like 14,000, 15, up, up to $29,000. In the United States, it is only $500 per, per child. So that shows where our values are, where our priorities are, unfortunately. Uh, you know, And of course, it is hard. Parenting is hard. And we can't do this alone. Yeah, yeah, but those sorts of early intervention support programs for child care, for preschool, for kindergarten, all of those things, when we invest early, provide just an enormous amount of, of support for those formative early years um, that, that end up changing the trajectories, particularly for those most vulnerable children. 
Yeah, I mean, we 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 want violence to end. Why aren't we, instead of fighting violence now, let's invest in early childhood education when the brain is developing the fastest in the first three years. Let's support those families and educators and caregivers who are invested in raising the the you know the young the youngsters so that they will grow up, you know, reaching their full potential and their brains will develop optimally. And, and hopefully we will minimize violence in the world. Like it's all upside down. It seems like it's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But as you're saying, the, the policies tend to be very reactionary. We do something once there's a problem, once it's occurred, rather than many of these other countries that rather than being reactionary are preventative. And they see the benefits of those sorts of early investment, early prevention. And and that approach is extremely successful. Yeah, that's why I love your work that it's more, instead of the risk factors, let's increase the protective factors. It's, It's similar, similar philosophy. Danielle, thank you so much for joining me today. I I really enjoyed this time. It went by very quickly. I love the topic of your research interest. Um, I would love to stay connected to hear more. And if there is more interesting research, I would love to have you on and, and share with my audience your discoveries, especially around this pandemic. It's very interesting. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I really loved this conversation and let's definitely stay in touch. That concludes today's conversation, my dear listener. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. These are some of my favorite topics to talk about. What is your biggest takeaway from this conversation? Did you learn something new? How you may apply what you gleaned from this episode into your life? I love hearing from you. If you have a comment, question, or feedback about the podcast in general, or about this episode, please get in touch. Send me a note to the email info at authenticparenting.com. Call the number 732-763-2576 and leave a voicemail. And for you, my international listener, there is a free tool on the contact page of my website. Go to authenticparenting.com forward slash contact and send me an audio message. If you enjoy the podcast, you can help us out by rating it or reviewing it on the platform of your choice. Also, consider becoming a patron on patreon.com. With a small monthly contribution, you can support your favorite show and join our existing 21 patrons who together contribute $121 towards our monthly goal of $500. You can find the show and follow it wherever podcasts are played. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and elsewhere. And if you want to know what I'm up to in my private life, you can follow me on Instagram, the only social media platform that I use. Until next week, connect to the present moment, to yourself and your children. I am Anna Seewald. Thank you so much for listening. Music.